Welcome to the Addiction Solution Podcast. I'm Michelle Dunbar. Enjoy listening and watching as addiction experts Mark Sheeran and I cover controversial as well as helpful topics on addiction, how to move past it, and other related subjects. As two of the co-founders of the Freedom Model, Mark and I will give you a completely new perspective on the topics that matter to you. We will take to task the Recovery Society's lies and misinformation and replace them with facts, research, and the methods to move on from addiction struggles without 12-step meetings, rehabs, and the shackles of endless recovery. Let's escape the treatment and recovery trap together and learn to be free. Welcome to the truth. Hey, everybody. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Addiction Solution Podcast. I'm Michelle Dunbar. And I'm Mark Sheeran, and we are the uh, co-authors of the Freedom Model for Addictions. Yes, um, which is a, com- a book, a revolutionary book about addiction, in case you're new to our podcast. And if you are new, this is episode 145. So there's 144 more episodes that you can binge listen to or binge watch yeah. on YouTube. Um, if you're like me and you like to go back to back to back sometimes. Um, and all of them can help you to solve an addiction. That's right. And so our approach is completely different. Uh, Michelle and I were the first uh, people to to coin the term non-12 step. And uh, so the Freedom Model is the antithesis of what Alcoholics Anonymous represents. Um, we don't believe that you're powerless over a substance. We don't believe that you are diseased because you're not. In you're fact, not. the disease concept is made up. Um, and but you do, if you have a problem, you have a preference for heavy intoxication, and that preference can change. And look at we're not saying that um, we're not saying that people don't feel powerless. We're not saying that there isn't, um, you know, th- that it, it's not a a confounding habit um, that can make you absolutely feel hopeless at times. Yeah, um, for sure. You know, we were once struggling. Yeah. And and we were in that pool of hopeless people who felt compelled to use and who felt addicted and who felt uh, miserable, frankly, and suicidal in my case. And I know Michelle felt the same way. I did. Um, I did. So we've been down a pretty rough road as well. So we understand that side of it too, but feelings are different than facts. And, and so uh, once you understand the facts, uh, you can change your preference and move on with your life without the encumbrances of meetings, recovery, rehabs, and endless therapies. So this brings us to the question we're going to answer today. Okay. The topic that we're going to talk about is, is it better? I mean, we, we've been accused online now of being irresponsible for, um, you know, that we're, we're spreading dangerous information by telling people that they can reduce their use to moderate levels by basically telling them the truth. Because uh, the, the research is very, very clear mm-hmm. that nobody ever actually loses control. So is it better to lie to people like the treatment industry does because look at people in the treatment industry know that they're lying to people. A a lot of them do know that Um, because the research is pretty clear that, that, you know, people that once qualified as being addicted um, can, you know, reduce their use or drinking to non problematic levels. Um, So, so when they tell people that's not possible, they're lying. So, but they're lying because they want you to choose abstinence. Yeah, I think that there's a real attractiveness in the treatment community to make things very black and white um, because you can control people, you can control the masses, and you can make a lot of money doing that. If you convince somebody that um, there's really no nuance to their drinking or drugging, that the answer is you have a disease, therefore that's why you get high and drink so much, you need to stop and you need to be in treatment the rest of your life. You can just keep, you know, swiping the credit card. Hmm. Um, and I think that, that there's a, a attractiveness for the industry. Oh, there. that's for sure. Um, and there's an attractiveness to the people to have a black and white answer, because one of the things that happens when you drink and drug so heavily is you do wonder to yourself, what the hell is wrong with me? Huh. You know, why do I keep doing this thing? You know, and and in the face of these awful consequences. 
Now that's a that's a whole discussion that we've covered in many of the other podcasts. Um, that that would take us an hour to go through Just on its own. Yeah. Um, but but anyway, yeah. You, should we be lying to people and saying you have to abstain? And we're not willing to do that. We're willing to say that anybody can moderate. We're not an advocate of moderation, just wow. like we're not an advocate of abstaining and we're not an advocate of heavy use. What the freedom model represents is that you have all three choices and you get to determine as a free thinking human being, which is best for you. That's what we advocate. But being that moderation is an option, should we be hiding that option? Now, I'll tell you, I want to give a caveat that's really, really, really important. And that is, if you think that you can't moderate and that you are an addict or an alcoholic and you self-subscribe to that identity, don't try to moderate because God, you're going to no. fail. You know, if you believe that you can't and then you try, you're not going to, you're not going to succeed. The other thing is if you believe that you're an addict, that there's a loss of control and you fully believe in that religious idea, well, then, then moderation is going to fall flat. You're just not going to do it. So don't attempt something that from the get go, you know, you're going to fail at. Right. It's, it's called the self-fulfilling prophecy, right? You, you've been taught and you have this belief, you've taken on this identity of somebody that, that can't, um, drink responsibly that can't, that the moment that you get a substance in your system, you're going to be out of control. Right. You're off to the races. Yeah. You will manifest that any attempt to moderate will be undermined by that belief system. That's, a, that's exactly, that's a perfect way of saying it. Um, so, so it would be irresponsible of us to say everybody can moderate w without that, that caveat. Now, when you're on some, a platform like TikTok, you got a minute to say your <laughs> right, piece to say what you want to you know? say. So you have to do this in multiple videos and, and it does piss people off, you know, it freaks them out when we say anybody can moderate, but it's the truth. Anybody it can the truth, but you have to know that you're not trapped and that there are no powers of addictiveness in drugs. You have to know that there is no loss of control, that you are always doing what you want to be doing. You can't do something you don't want to do. Right. Um, and, these are just truths, but if you don't understand them, you're in that mixed bag where, you know, you believe you're compelled to use. You believe there is a nebulous force called addiction that's driving your use. And that's just not true. So for, for the people out there that are listening and, and, you know, maybe you've been abstinent for many years. Yeah. Here's the thing about this. People will automatically go to, well, I knew, I knew, um, you know, Bob. Bob was sober 20 years. He was sober 20 years. He was one of those really bad alcoholic and, and crackheads, right? You know, and, and the minute Bob took a drink of alcohol, he was, he was drinking heavy. We went back to the crack house in 20 years. And, and so they go to these examples, which are compelling. Yeah. Yeah. A anytime you have anecdotal evidence, that's very emotional and maybe Bob died. Yeah. Right? Tragically died in a crack house or tragically died, you know, in his bed, drinking himself to death after 20 years of sobriety and two months he was dead. Um, they even have stories like that in the big book yeah. uh, of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, well, look at if Bob sat there for 20 years in a church basement meeting saying over and over, if I ever go back to it. I'm going to die. It'll kill me, oh, which is exactly what happened to my grandfather. Yeah. Jails, institutions or mm -hmm, death. Mm -hmm. The inevitability is that you throw away all 20 years in one drink because you'll yes. be off to the races. That, that is, that is, that's dangerous. Folklore. That's dangerous to tell people. And, and that's why we have to say the truth because that, that belief system really does kill people. That's right legitimately. So, so you have been going, you know, even people who, and I, I can remember talking to somebody about this many years ago, even people who maybe they went to meetings for three or four years, right? They stopped going to meetings, but they stayed abstinent and still kept that belief, still kept that belief. If I even take one drink, then, you know, forget it. I'm, I'm doomed. And so maybe they stopped going to meetings after a few years. They went to, they went four or five years, not drinking, 
you know, they started thinking, you know what? I bet I'm fine. I can be fine. And so they go back to drinking. Now they're struggling again. And that reinforces in their mind, oh, AA was right. And I stopped going to meetings. And, and, and all it took was three or four years. And here I am drinking heavy again. Well, you kept a belief system twofold, right? You kept the belief system that if you drank one drink, you would be out of control. And, and you kept your preference for intoxication intact that entire time. So that's why the freedom model is 450 pages. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because there is, it's not only the addiction disease mythology that's a problem. Okay. It's not only this idea that people lose control and then they cross an imaginary line. It's also the idea that they self medicate that substances hold these powers for you, which we talk about all the time because it is so important. And it's also this idea that, oh, one, what is it? One drink and not, is not enough and too many. How does that go? It, it, it goes like this. Uh, one drunk, one drink is too many. A thousand is not enough. A thousand is not enough. It's, I mean, those belief systems are so dangerous. They're so damaging and they are the reason that look at, if you see somebody that, you know, was a heavy drinker and drug user, like so many people are during the, between the ages of like 16 and 25, and they were very heavy, totally would have qualified as a, an alcoholic or an addict or somebody with substance use disorder. Um, then they spontaneously stop, move on with their life. Later on in life, it's very rare they have a problem. You know what's funny about those people? I'm going to jump in here. Everybody ignores it. Everybody. And it's, uh, and it's it's such a huge number of people. Like, it's, a, it's a massive number of people. But because it doesn't fit the, the narrative, that that sample is completely ignored. Well, they're not entirely ignored because... They're they're thrown into this category of not a real addict. Oh yeah, alcoholic. so they get they get redefined. <laughs> they were one. They were as they long totally as, qualified. As long as they fit the narrative, they 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 qualified. If they went to AA, they would never be told that they're not an alcoholic. Oh, as God, a matter no. of fact, they would be told that they have to come to grips with the fact that they are one. Absolutely right. But as soon as they get well on their own, they're no longer a part. So that, that's a classic case of just making it so that the person doesn't fit their narrative <laughs> right. and, and is excluded as a, as a viable uh, population in their study. So it's bullshit. It's you know, such it's, bullshit. It's cherry picking. <laughs> um, and so we all know somebody, the Uncle Jack, that we used to drink for 40 years and then just stopped, and, just stopped. and lived a healthy lifestyle. Um, and yeah. yes, some of those people go through detox. Mm -hmm. They do. I did. Yeah. He did. Yeah. You know, there are many people that, that, you know, have withdrawal from opiates that never have a problem again, yep. that just spontaneously stop. It's the vast majority. So, so we're not just talking about alcohol here. Okay. And, and what Mark said is true. You look at, you don't just get to throw out to reclassify people that don't fit with your theory when you're doing research. Right. And that's exactly what happened in addiction. And here's something about research and peer review. I want to just, I want to just say this. Peer review is problematic in the science world in, in some cases, because it, it can actually exist to keep a paradigm strong. Yeah. Because usually it's a university that's based on funding. Yes. And their funding is based on the study being in a certain direction. Yes. And if, if the results come out the opposite or different, the funding goes away. Yep. So, so the thing about the research that we've collected in the freedom model is it's, it all is exactly shows exactly the opposite about addiction. And it is all peer reviewed and it is, but it's just ignored. It's just ignored. Now, uh, Stanton Peel, who is a friend of ours, um, started blowing the whistle on this in the seventies. Yeah. And then, then there were tons of other guys like Jeffrey Shaler. He's awesome. Yeah. Carl Hart, you know, Peter Venturelli. There's all these people that started looking at this and going, wait, wait a, minute. a minute. Yeah. 
that none there's so much research that refutes the disease concept that refutes all of these ideas and i think the most important thing for people to know and we 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 mention this in just about every podcast is that most people get past the problem whether they're treated or not and yep. very and very few get treatment percentage wise so so here's this world this world of people that don't fit the narrative. And here's what's interesting. I was at, at the Skatic Oak Fair one time and I met an old f- friend's sister. She was the older sister. We'll, we'll say her name is Debbie. And Debbie, uh, I met the father and the father said, hey, do you know who that is? No. And, and she, he goes, that's Mark Sharon. She was like, oh my God. you know. And she came up and she hugged me and, and we were talking and somehow she goes, I see on Facebook and I went to rehab and you know, it's a disease. I said, uh, listen, Debbie, it's, it's not a disease. She goes, I know it's not. I just say that shit because you know, everybody says to that. Say yeah. it. She goes, I'm supposed to say that, but nobody believes that shit. It's so ridiculous. And I said, it is ridiculous. Now I see her on Facebook all the time and her life has just taken off like a rocket ship. And so a couple of years later, I saw her at the fair again. And I said, Deb, how, how are you doing? And uh, she goes, fantastic. I said, so you're, you're still sober and all that? And she goes, yeah, I have a few pops now and again, but, but my life is fantastic. And I say, did you, did you go to AA? Do you still do any of that? And she goes, God, no. God, no. I'm free of all that stuff. She goes, I saw a couple of your videos. And I said, that makes more sense to me. That's common sense. It's obvious. And we all know people that we grew up with. She was saying this to me. We all know people that we grew up with that were total fuck up. She goes, hell, you were a fuck up. You know? <laughs> and, and, and they're all okay now. And she goes, yeah, some of them died. And she goes, but, but the vast majority of us, we were all screwballs, Mark, when we were young. And I said, I know, I know. She goes, we just grew out of it. I said, I know. Yeah. Yeah. But there, I, I can hear it though. There are some people like, yeah, but you just said it. Some people die. So the question is, okay, if you accept that what we're saying is true. And, and I have to tell you, there are books that we cite. Our book is filled with resources um, of, of researchers and authors that, that knew this. Even some that knew this and still would say, but maybe you should go to AA. Oh, I know the, the, the caveats. Yeah, because they were fearful because even though they know the truth, they didn't want to tell it to you because they don't think you can handle it. Here, th- th- that's a great point. So there's three books in particular that we cite that at the very end, the entire book or books in this three cases is devoted to debunking the disease concept of addiction. Yes. yes. And then at the very end, all three of them have one sentence that says, but if you need AA, you, you should probably go to AA. They're so frightened against going against the cult. Yep. That they have to put in that little caveat, that little safety net. And that's sort of the peer review thing phenomenon. And that is, I really don't want to get lambasted by the cult. Now, the good news about us is we don't care. I don't care. We've been attacked by it for uh, more than 30 years. Yeah. (laughs) And and they know that we're not going anywhere. And there's absolutely no way I'm going to shut my mouth. And actually, I'm dangerous to them. Yeah. Because they want to fight. I have no problem publicly debating anybody on this topic. And they never asked me to a debate. No, and not since a couple of, he did a couple ago. of podcasts and, and the people like, it's kind of like he's converted the, the, like the recovery podcasters to, to being like, Oh yeah, you're, you make a lot of sense. <laughs> I had a couple of them two two podcasts where they, where they invited me and I knew they were coming from a recovery centered model. I said, do you know what I do? And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just want to get you on there. We're, we're open-minded. But what they did is they set me against in the middle of the podcast. They're like, Oh, we have a caller coming in. This is Jack. He runs all these rehabs and he's an expert in the industry and let's do a debate. <laughs> and I was like, okay. Okay. And then I slapped him silly. <laughs> Proverbially. <Right>? Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. And by the end that they were all like, okay, what we're, this is, you make sense. Oh my God. You know? And, and so look at the truth is the truth is the truth. And the wonderful part about it is it's not bad. The result of the truth is that you're free. That's a win-win. It is. But if you hold on to your ideas, like we st- said earlier, that addiction is a force that is outside of you 
that addictiveness is in a drug, like some sort of force, life force that can change your mind or compel you, that lie is dangerous. What makes it so dangerous and the thing that I think probably harmed me the most from even before going to AA, from growing up in it, was this idea that there's that you can't trust your own mind and your own yeah. thinking yeah, that's... and that your own mind and your own thinking are going to cause you to do something you don't really want to do. Like there's a dual mind. I, yeah. I me, and, me and Steve wrestled with how to explain this in the book, but when you think about being compelled to use beyond your will from a brain disease, from a chronic brain disease, that's a common idea. That's absolute horseshit, but, God, it's, but it's so but, awful, but they push it. That's saying that there is another another mind within your own and that the drug somehow makes that other mind take operative control of you. And nobody can explain how that happens. No. Nobody can. The, the brain theorists, they, they just make these sort of blanket statements about the brain being hijacked. Hijacked in, implies there's a force that's doing the hijacking, meaning the drug somehow knows. But but here's what's interesting. How does the drug know a behavior, one behavior, one series of thoughts dedicated to using drugs, but yet it doesn't affect whether you have control in other areas of your life? You seem to be able to get in your car and drive sanely. You hmm. seem to be able to keep your marriage together or not. You seem to be able to do all the same functions in your life but it compels you only in this one arena, and that is what you think about a substance. That is such an unbelievable stretch, and nobody can explain it because they can't pinpoint a certain serotonin or dopamine receptor. They can't, they can't say it, it affects this. It ends up that it's much more complex than that, and the brain studies don't show how any of that happens. No. Not the brain scans don't show, nothing shows that. There's there's no way to quantify or measure addiction. That's right. So if you want to know more about that, you have to read our book. I can't describe it to you in, in 10 minutes in a podcast, but there is no dual mind. There is no hijacking of brain tissue that compels you because your brain doesn't think. Your mind thinks. And then your brain processes the mind. It's a slave to the mind. So your mind isn't a thing. So a drug's molecule can't affect a metaphysical thing called the mind. So these are some pretty complex ideas that need explanation that we explain. But the rest of the industry just says, ah, oh, your brain is hijacked. Right. And, You're out of control. Yeah. And, You're out of control. Um, but it, but but then there's a lot. I can remember when I started questioning the um the oxymorons, the things that that. And then what what I was told was, well, this is a program full of contradictions. Well, fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Come on. Yeah. I, you know because when, if you if you start to think critically, none of it makes any sense. None of it makes any sense because I wanted to know when I went, when I went into a, when I quit drinking, cause I quit drugs on my own several months before, but then I quit, I, when I finally quit drinking and I didn't go to a meeting for a few days for five days before I, I, uh, I quit drinking, five, went five days detoxing, then went to a meeting. Right. And I wanted to know what's going to make me start drinking again. Right. What if is if it's if it's not in my mind, if I'm not in control, then I'm going to be struck drunk at some point. Please tell me what that is because I need to know how to avoid it. Right. Right. And if you lose control, th that is an absolute statement. It Lo is. Losing control means that you have literally that you are a drug taking zombie. You are a substance taking zombie. So. We know that that's bullshit because everybody that's listening to this right now, everybody didn't start and endlessly use substances in a loss of control pattern forever. Nope. There isn't a single one of you in hundreds of thousands of downloads that started, 
and couldn't stop. And then they say, yeah, but I, I passed out. And I said, yeah. And then when you got up, did you start right back up again? Yeah, I did that for three months. And I said, oh, what happened at the end of three months? Oh, I was so sick. I went to detox. Who, who, did you, somebody lock you in, in the car to take you? Did they handcuff you to the side? You, you were a drug taking zombie, right? You had lost control. Well, no, not really. It's not like that, Mark. Or I uh, went to jail. Right. And so I say, I know it's not like that because I used to feel hopelessly addicted but I would go on a three day bender, get sick, and then I'd have and then spend a couple of days not doing it. That's right. Now at the end, because I believe so deeply in the, in the addiction uh, religion and the compelled use and idea, and I had withdrawal and I thought withdrawal compelled me to use that. I spent three months drinking almost perpetually. Yep. And, but that's all based on the idea that somebody told me that was going to happen that's and then right. I fulfilled it with my own ideas. <laughs> and then I felt more compelled because yes. I was reinforcing my own ideas, which yes. were actually the ideas of somebody else before that. So we see that that's, that's ritualized folklore, yes. you know, and then you, you act out on what you believe is true. So we have to be really careful. When we start talking about loss of control, there is no evidence. And we go, we go through it in the freedom model in detail. Appendix A is filled with this research that people have done. Many people have done. This research has been done over and over and over and over again. There is zero loss of control phenomenon. It doesn't happen. Not ever. That's right. Now you can feel a loss of control yep. emotionally. You can manifest it yourself, but you're actually choosing it. So there's no loss of control, um, but it's all belief-based. It's so, all belief-based. So the fact that you believe it to be true, that you manifest it is a choice, which means you didn't lose control. Yes. And as a matter of fact, you even, here's what's crazy about this. Even though you have this belief, even you do stop. You do stop That's at right. different points right. because I did not go drinking day in and day out until after an intervention was done with me where I was told that when I was asked about my drinking, I said, I can take it or leave it. And I was, and the person said to me, why don't you leave it? It was my dad. Why don't you leave it? And I'm like, I don't want to. And, and he wasn't quite there yet with, with his own research. So he was like, well, I don't believe you can. And so thus I left that little meeting and went on a six month binge where I was pretty much drinking continuously for about six months. Now I say that I know there was days in there when I had to not drink for a specific reason. Right. Right. And, yeah. and I'm sure that I went several hours not drinking in order to, I think I had a speeding ticket. I had to go to court for, I think I, you know, little things that, but when I went to AA, of course that that's glossed over. That doesn't, doesn't, you know, if you qualify, I totally qualified for being there. Um, and I believed in my mind that I had lost control for that period of time. And, um, but boy, when you think objectively and open-mindedly about your substance using history, you can see those places where you stopped, yep. where you stopped yep. and it blows all of this out of the water. Yep. So, so it's wrong to lie to people. Yeah. So let's wrap it back around and summarize. So the only reason we tend to lie to people about this is first, because the treatment industry doesn't want you to know that you can move past it without their model. Without them. Yeah. So it would, if, if everybody knew the research that 91% of all drinkers will matriculate out of problematic use through moderation, through successful moderation and or abstinence. Yep. 50% moderate, 41% abstain. There's no need for treatment. And that's, th that's the truth. That's what happens. Uh, people learn the freedom model and we short, we shorten that process up for people. We show them all the research in one place and we shorten it up. And uh, within four weeks, you can move on from your problem with all the, the necessary education. Um, so should we say that you can't moderate in some way now the other there let's get out of the treatment industry but let's just say that it's dangerous to tell people that 
Well, it's not. It's not if you if you have the caveat, hey, anybody can moderate, but but you have to let go of your idea that drugs have powers. You have to change the way you see addiction completely. You have to understand there's no lost control. You have to understand that there's no compelled use. Um, there's You have to deconstruct the brain disease theory. And that's what we do in the freedom model. So that when somebody decides to moderate, they do it based on the fact that they are a free person freely choosing and none of those other myths come into play. So I don't feel any trepidation to say that you can moderate with all those caveats. Right. Okay. Now, if you want to keep your appetite based of, of drugs and alcohol and then moderate, it's not going to work. I mean, it's pretty simple. If you keep all the mythology that it's an amazing experience and that it's magical and that you're addicted and all that, and oh, I'm going to moderate now. Well, that's ridiculous. <laughs> that's just ridiculous. You're not going to. Okay. It's not that you can't. It's not that you can't. It's that you probably won't because you still love it. And you still put it on, on a mythology. pedestal. Right. Yeah. You still think it's the best way you can be happy at any given moment in time. And you keep those beliefs intact and you're going to do what you're going to do. But here's the most important thing about telling people the truth. Okay. Because the only way that people solve an addiction, there's one way they do it. And that is they change their mind. They change their mind about substances and decide they can be happier using less or none at all. That's it. That's the only way. Now, people are going to say, oh, you think the freedom model is the only way? I didn't say that. I didn't say that at all. The freedom model isn't a way to stop. The That's freedom right. model tells That's you right. how people stop. Yeah. <laughs> and in all the various ways, all we do is give you an education so that you decide for yourself. Yes. That's it. That's it. That's it. So you know, oh, it's interesting when we watch people, some people, when they, when they come to the retreat, they get it. Sometimes they get it in the first week that they're here and they're like, yeah. holy cow, all this time. And then just something just clicks where they're like, I, ex I know exactly what you're talking about. And I know I'll never be an addict again, mm -hmm. you know, and, and sometimes it takes a little bit longer, but to watch people come to that realization that I'm in control and I've been in control this whole time. And I've been doing exactly what I wanted to do because I really love being high, really love being drunk. But you know what? I don't have to do it to be happy. I don't really need it that much anymore. And you know what? It's not as great as I thought it was. That's right. You know, so that's how people change. And so the key, the reason, the number one reason that you don't lie to people about this is so that they can make an informed decision and begin to trust their own thinking because that's what's going to help them to change. That's right. So I think that was a good way to end it maybe. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> all right. So how can you uh, learn about all of this? Well, you can go to thefreedommodel.org. You can get a free digital download of our book, The Freedom Model for Addictions, or The Freedom Model for the Family. You go to the Our Books tab. You choose the book you want. Enter coupon code FREEDOM100 at checkout. And um, also at the beginning and at the end of this, we have commercials for some of our different products. Yeah, listen to the commercials because there's a product out there that's affordable. And uh, it's it, we've designed this over, over the last three decades to be very convenient for you to learn. Yes, yes. So, um, and of course, if you're struggling and you need help and you want to talk to to someone here, call us at 888 424 Two six two six. If you're watching on YouTube, it's right at the top uh, left-hand corner of your screen. And thank you, everyone, for all of your support and for listening to our podcast. Remember, if you like it, give us five-star review yeah. on uh, wherever you're listening, and um, share. Tell your friends about it. Share it with your friends. It helps us reach more people, folks. It does. Thanks right. very much. All right, take care.